Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour uh, with a telephone line open for you if you want to call in and ask any questions about the Bible or the Christian faith. You'll find a line open if you call right now. That may not be the case later, so let me give you the number. The number is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. Four eight four fifty seven thirty seven. You know, I got an email uh, just the other day that I thought I would like to address here on the air, and um, from Pete, he said, "Steve, everywhere I turn, I keep hearing that amillennialism or preterism or replacement theology or whatever is anti-Semitic by nature." I know you are identified with these views. Are you anti-Semitic? And do you do these views encourage or require one to be anti-Semitic? Um, well, this is a I think a, bit, a much misunderstood thing. There's nothing about any of those views, and by the way, they're not all the same views. Our millennialism is a view uh, about the millennial reign of Christ, uh, which was held by most Christians throughout history, and is an independent belief from, say, preterism or, or partial preterism. I'm not a full preterist, but a partial preterist is somebody who sees the book of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse a certain way, namely that they see it as uh, principally discussing uh, or predicting the fall of Jerusalem. Now, you could be an amillennialist without being a preterist, and many amillennialists have been. For example, Martin Luther and John Calvin, they were uh, amillennial, but they were not preterist. And uh, Abraham Kuyper uh, was uh, amillennial. Uh, but not preterist. He was he was a futurist. <clears throat> Luther and Calvin were historicists. In other words, there's different views of the Book of Revelation, which a person who's a millennial could hold, or a person who's post millennial could hold. It's true that if you're pre millennial, you're probably going to be a futurist about the Book of Revelation. But if you're a millennial or post millennial, you could take any number of views. So partial preterism is not joined at the hip with any millennial view. But they are often linked together by their critics. And then, of course, you mentioned replacement theology. Uh, replacement theology is a term that nobody I know uses unless they are against it. Um, the truth is that re what, what, what dispensationalists refer to as replacement theology is a doctrine that was held by all the church fathers, and dispensationalists mentioned this. Uh, I have a book by David Hawking on replacement theology. I have other books about replacement theology, and, and they're critical of replacement theology, but they admit that as soon as the apostles were dead, this is what the church began to teach, that the earliest church fathers were uh, teaching the doctrine that they are now calling replacement theology. This is also the church's view in the medieval period and in the Reformation. And it's still the view of a very large percentage of churches today. In fact, almost everybody who isn't replacement theology, as they use that term, <clears throat> is usually a dispensationalist or a quasi-dispensationalist. Because dispensationalism is pretty much the view that, uh, that decided that so-called replacement theology was a bad thing. Now, what is replacement theology? Now, if you hear it from a, somebody who uses that term, they're always a critic of it, uh, they will say, this means that the church replaced Israel. Well, there's a sense in which that may be considered to be true, but it certainly isn't the most accurate or enlightening definition of the term. More enlightening would be to say it's the view that the new covenant has replaced the old covenant. Israel remains the same. Israel was serving God under the old covenant, but then the new covenant came and replaced that, and now they serve, the true Israel serves God under the new covenant. Uh, Paul compares it to one woman having two marriages, that is two covenants. In Romans chapter 7, he says we were married to the law. Okay, that was the, the people of God were relating to God through the covenant like marriage covenant, of, of the law. But then he said, we died to the law through the body of Christ so that we'd be married to another, even him that is risen from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. So, in other words, there's a new covenant that has replaced the old covenant. Same woman, same, same people. The people of God once related to God through the Sinaitic covenant. Today, the real people of God relate to him through the new covenant. That's, that's the more accurate way to put it, and it's hardly controversial because everyone knows that the people of God were under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. And then anyone who reads the New Testament is aware 
that Hebrews 8.13 says, where there's a new covenant, the old covenant is obsolete. Okay, so you don't have two covenants, two marriages at the same time. That's why Paul said that the woman who takes a second husband while her first husband's still living is committing adultery. Now, he's not giving a teaching about adultery he's, or marriage or divorce. He's, he's giving a teaching about two covenants, which historically the people of God have related to God through. In the Old Testament times, they were under the covenant of the law. Now they're under the covenant of Christ, the new covenant. It's like a new marriage. It's a new covenant. And you can't have both of them at the same time. Paul said that would be adultery. So this is, a, uh, it, to my mind, this is why this view is never considered controversial from the time of the apostles until the 1800s when dispensationalism arose to challenge it, say, no, this is not true. Now, dispensationalism mistakenly says the church replaces Israel. That's not true. But, but this is why they say that this doctrine, which, again, we don't call it <coughs> replacement theology, it's called supersessionism. The, the, the new covenant superseded the old covenant, so it's superseding, supersession of the covenants. This is not anti-Semitic. It is saying that the Jewish people and Gentile people can be the people of God. At one time, Jews and Gentiles could be the people of God under the Old Covenant. When God made the covenant at Mount Sinai, he, he strictly, uh, I mean, not strictly, he, he made it very clear that uh, the Gentiles could be part of this. He said, if any stranger who lives among you wants to be circumcised and keep the law, then he'll be like a stranger, or like a native of the land. In other words, you don't have to be Jewish to be one of God's people under the Old Covenant. Same is true in the New Covenant. So the point is, you were God's people if you were faithful to the current covenant. And when it was the Old Covenant, those who were under the Old Covenant, whether Jew or Gentile, were God's people and were called Israel. Under the New Covenant, the same is true. You can be Jewish or Gentile, but if you're faithful to the New Covenant, uh, you're, you're God's people. You're Israel. And so Paul compares Israel to an olive tree, which he, uh, an image he gets from Jeremiah, from Jeremiah 11:16, where Israel is compared to an olive tree with branches broken off. And Paul said, well, yeah, there are branches that are broken off of Israel right now, off that olive tree. That's because of their unbelief in Christ. But, of course, the believing Jews have not been broken off. Only the unbelieving branches have been. The believing branches remain. They haven't been replaced. The tree hasn't been replaced. Israel is the tree. And the branches that are faithful to the covenant are the ones that stay attached to the tree. The ones that were unfaithful to the covenant and rejected the Messiah, they have been broken off the tree. But Gentiles, some Gentiles have been faithful to the covenant. They've been grafted into the tree. The tree is Israel. And it's comprised of branches, Jewish and Gentile who are defined not by their race, but by their faith. And that's the whole teaching of the New Testament is that people are not commended to God by who their ancestors were, but they're commended to God by who they are and what their relationship with God is. And that would be, of course, faith in Christ. There's nothing anti-Semitic about that because it doesn't say anything different about Jews than about Gentiles. In fact, it says Jews and Gentiles are pretty much well, they're, they're the same. If they're in Christ, they're equal. There's no Jew or Gentile in Christ. And if they're not in Christ, they're equally lost. They're not part of the covenant. So that's not anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic means against Semites. Now, I just want to say this before I move on to, because we have some callers. But um, just the other day, I just stumbled upon a discussion between Candace Owens and a, a Rabbi Barclay who had accused her of being anti-Semitic. In fact, he had written an article against her calling her a Jew-hating bigot. Now, she had never said anything against Jews. Uh, she didn't give any evidence of being a Jew-hater. What did she say? Well, she said that in the conflict in the Middle East, she wants to look at it level-headedly. She wants to realize, you know, wants to analyze it to see who's doing wrong and who's doing right before she just kind of follows the crowd in making a statement about it. Now, to my mind, that's what I've always said, too. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't support a nation just because you like them. Uh, you support their actions or not, depending on whether they are just and good actions or not. Same thing with our own country. We don't support our country no matter what it does. There are things that are unjust that our country does, and we don't, we're not supportive of that. Same thing with Israel or, or the Palestinians or whoever. 
Ukraine, Russia, you name it. We evaluate people not by their country, but by their actions. That's how God evaluates people, and so that's what Christians do. But because Candace Owens had not come right out and just uh, spoken you know, solidly as a loyalist to Israel, Rabbi uh, Barclay said that she was a Jew-hating bigot. Now, what's, to my surprise, I've heard even Dennis Prager, whom I like a lot, I've heard Dennis Prager say that if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. And this is very confusing. And because, uh, uh, you know, for example, a person like myself, and I think Candace Owens is probably in the same boat, never had a bad thought about Jewish people as Jews. Now, there are some Jewish people like Judas Iscariot, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud. There's some Jews uh, that I think were pretty bad people, but I could name even more Gentiles who are bad people. This has nothing to do with being against Jews. It has been against badness. Now, Rabbi Barclay said, well, anti-Semitism is an evolving term. He said it originally was being against the Jewish religion, but it evolved into being against the Jewish people by race, and now it means being against the state of Israel. Now, wait a minute. That, if you want to be uh, not called an anti-Semite, you need to keep up to date with the changing definitions. You can be judged for being anti-Semite, by saying all people, Jews and Gentiles, are equal. And this is exactly the same as if in the days when BLM was in the news, if you said all lives matter, that wasn't good enough. It's not good to say all lives matter because that's a white supremacist thing to say. You have to say black lives matter. But, of course, all lives matter. And that's the Christian thing to say because it's true. Likewise, if we say, well, do you think Jews are, uh, you know, are specially loved by God? I think, well, Jesus died for the whole world, so the whole world must be specially loved by God. You know, Jews and Gentiles. No, 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 but you have to say the Jews are better, more loved by God. He has, you know, they're specialer than other people. Well, how about if I just say all people are beloved by God? All people need Jesus. That's not good enough. If you're not placing Jews in a higher position than everyone else, you're a bigot. Now, let me just clear this up. If anti-Semitism means being against somebody's religion, the Jewish religion, well, I'm not against people who have the wrong religion. I'm against their religion. It's an anti-Christian religion. Judaism hates, I mean, read the Talmud if you want to find out. It hates Jesus. Um, conservative Jews in this country, uh, they're, they're very tolerant of evangelicals because evangelicals are their biggest supporters. But their Talmud that they, the Orthodox Judaism follows hates Jesus calls him a sorcerer and a, and a, and a bastard, okay? Uh, that's not very friendly toward Jesus. So the Jewish religion and the Muslim religion and the Buddhist religion are all false religions, and I'm against those religions. I'm not against people who hold them. I'm not, I don't hate people who hold that religion, but I'm, I'm, I don't agree with the religion. Does that make me anti-Semite? Well, now what if we change it over from their religion to their race, because Jews can be known either by race or by religion. Well, I, you know, anti-Semite means being against a Shemite, somebody who's descended from Shem. <clears throat> uh, I'm not against people who are descended from Shem. I'm not against people as a group who are descended from anybody. I don't care what race somebody is. I believe all lives matter. Uh, I'm not a racist. I don't place one race above another just kind of de facto because they are of that race. That is not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Jewish at all either religion or race. I don't believe their religion is true, but I don't hate people who have that religion or who have that race. In fact, all the original Christians were Jewish. How could any Christian be against the Jewish race? Jesus is of the Jewish race. Well, then what about the Israeli thing, if you're an anti-Zionist? Well, I'm not anti-Zionist, but I don't necessarily affirm that Zionism is a move of God. I think that Zionism is a political movement, and it needs to be evaluated just like any other political movement, including our own. Our own country has to be evaluated uh, politically on its merits and its demerits. And I believe that about Israel, too. Uh, I don't think it's anti-Semitic to, to hold certain political opinions. I don't think it's anti-Semitic to say, I disagree with the Jewish religion. And to say that the Jewish race is the same as anybody else is the opposite of anti-Semitic. It's the opposite of racist. And therefore, there's nothing about these positions, these theological positions, that translates into anti-Semitism. 
There is something about dispensationalism, though, that requires you to say Jews are better or in some way more special to God, closer to God's heart, than Gentiles are. And you simply won't find Jesus or Paul agreeing with that anywhere in the Bible at all. So that's not anti-Semitic. It's just, you know, just agreeing with what Jesus said and what Paul said and so forth. It, it may disappoint people who want you to put Jews on a pedestal, but you don't have to put people on a pedestal to be to love them, to be friendly toward them, and to have no hatred toward them. So these people who are telling you that these uh, eschatological views are uh, you know, anti-Semitic, uh, they're using words to their own advantage, uh, you know, just to make their theological point sound more right. Um, in fact, I've some some major advocates of Zionism, and Christian ones, I've heard have compared compared amillennialism with Hitler. But there's no comparison. Amillennialism does not advocate any uh, harm to be done to Jewish people. Hitler did. That's a very different thing. It's not in the same universe as uh, you know, biblical theology. Hitler was not following biblical theology. He might have been anti-Semitic, but it wasn't for biblical reasons. He didn't care what the Bible said. He was a demonic man. All right, so enough on that. I, that's an important thing. I spent a lot of time on that because people ask that a lot, and this is what I have, was written in here. Let's talk, to, um, let's talk to Hunter from Alabama. Hunter, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Good. Good. Um, when when you I'm listening to your debate with uh, James White on Calvinism, mm -hmm. and some some one of the things that communists say, I just don't understand. I wonder maybe you can shed a lot on this. I don't see from the Calvinist perspective how God saving someone, electing someone to be saved, and essentially choosing someone else to be. Uh, sentence to hell brings him glory. And they'll say yeah. that, that because that's the way that God charges to glorify himself. And I just don't see how that brings any glory to God in any shape, form, or fashion. Well, I don't either. And I think, I think the way many Calvinists would uh, argue, and I can't speak for all of them, but I've certainly talked to a lot of them, uh, many Calvinists would argue that God is glorified by bringing judgment on his enemies because it shows how how great and mighty and powerful he is that even if the whole world stands against him he can mow them right down you know that they 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 uh, conspire against the lord and against his anointed as it says in psalm 2 that he sits in the heavens and laughs and mocks them and then over overrules them and punishes them and his ability to do that shows that he's stronger than they are that he's uh you know he's the king over them uh you know his sovereignty his power to vindicate himself against his enemies. They say that glorifies him. Uh, now, I have to say, uh, maybe in a little tiny, tiny way it might, but I don't think so. I, think it, I don't think it does at all. I mean, if, uh, if a person was shrunk down to the size of an ant and started hurling insults at me and giving me the middle finger and calling me all kinds of names and started uh, you know, trying to uh, slander me and malign me, uh, and I said, well, watch, watch how, how, how strong I am. I'm going to step on you. Boom, you're dead. Uh, does that glorify me? Well, I guess it demonstrates I'm a lot bigger than him. But was there ever any question whether I was bigger than him? Uh, probably not. I mean, anyone who even knows who God is doesn't need any special demonstrations that he's bigger than his enemies because it it's, goes with the definition of him being God. He's bigger than the whole universe. Yet for him to smash little tiny bugs that are offending him may be something that he can do with ease, but I don't know that it, it, I, I, I don't know that that really makes him, uh, you know, look better, uh, whether it does or not. I think God is much more glorified in saving people. Uh, you know, when the Bible says God is love, well, it doesn't just mean he loves a few people. It means he is love. Now he might have to condemn some people, if they remain hostile toward him and uh, until death and so forth, they may have to be condemned. But that doesn't mean he didn't love them. And it certainly does not mean that he wanted them to be condemned or that he wanted them to remain his enemies till life. It says, in obviously, in Second Peter chapter 3, 
that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the Old Testament said the same thing in Ezekiel uh, 33, 11. God said, turn, turn up my reproof. Why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his evil ways and live. Now, both the Old and the New Testament make very clear that God has no interest in the wicked being punished. They may have to be punished if justice is going to be followed, but he doesn't, he doesn't want that. He wants, in every case, for them to repent. So to say about God that he had the power to save whom he wanted to unilaterally, and everyone who's not saved is someone he did not want to save because he could have, and therefore they went to hell because he wanted them to, is to create a different picture of God than God paints of himself. And this is not glorifying him. We might say, well, it glorifies him in my sight to see him mow down, you know, a thousand, uh, you know, uh, ants in an out ant colony because uh, he's so much bigger. Well, that might be your way of, you know, calculating, you know, greatness. His idea of calculating greatness is, he said, who would be the chief is the slave of all, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now, that's, that's greatness. That is greatness when, frankly, you can serve your enemy and love your enemy and do all you can to redeem your enemy. Uh, Mike in San Diego, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yeah, hi, hi Steve. Yeah, a long-time listener. Thank you for your ministry. Um, uh, I'm a, I, I'm not a dispensationalist, uh, but, um, I would call myself an amillennialist and a partial preterist, but I have a question, uh, about a subject that I, that I thought I read in scripture in the old Testament that I, that I can't find. What was there not another temple that was supposed, a supposed beautiful temple that was described somewhere that was conditional, uh, but was never built. Yes. 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 Ezekiel 40 through 47. Where, where, oh, okay. That's what I'm trying to, uh, I wanted to have you comment on, on that verse a little bit. And if that carries over into the, uh, the future temple argument and so forth. And, and, and I'll take your answer uh, on the radio. Okay. Okay, Mike, thanks for your call. Well, of course, there's many Christians, dispensationalists primarily, who believe there's going to be a third temple in Jerusalem. They believe there's some prediction that the Antichrist will put an image of himself in that temple. I can't find such a, a, a prediction. They're referring, of course, to uh, Revelation 13 and 2 Thessalonians 2, neither of which make any reference to an Antichrist setting himself up in a Jewish temple. But nonetheless, that's what they believe, and they believe that's a future temple. Now, therefore... If there is a future temple, there's already been two. Solomon's temple was destroyed by Babylon in 583 B.C., 586 B.C., excuse me. And uh, Zerubbabel built the second temple, which was embellished by Herod, and it was destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70. So two temples have stood and fallen, and therefore they believe there will be a third temple built uh, in our future. And, uh, well, where do you find that? Well, part of that is their assumption that the Antichrist is going to have to set himself up in a temple like that. But as I said, there's no statement in Scripture of that happening. Uh, there's no mention of a third Jewish temple in the New Testament. And uh, how about the Old Testament? Well, that's where dispensationalists get most of their theology, uh, their eschatology they get from the Old Testament. And there's only really two places there that could help. One is Ezekiel chapters 40 through 47, where there's simply a description of a temple given to Ezekiel at a time when the Jewish temple did not exist. Nebuchadnezzar had already destroyed the first temple. The second temple had not yet been rebuilt. It would be shortly afterwards. But in the interim, a temple blueprint is given to Ezekiel. And God tells him in chapter 43, verse 10 and 11, Son of man, describe the temple, meaning the one he's showing him, to the house of Israel. Now, they were in exile. They were in exile in Babylon. And he says, show this to them that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple. Now, if they are ashamed, if they are repentant for all they've done, well then, show them this temple. It'll be relevant to them. Were they? Apparently not. When Cyrus gave permission to all the Jews in Babylon to go back to Jerusalem, and there were millions of them, only 50,000 went back. And with limited manpower, limited resources, and limited zeal, 
Israel did not get this temple. They did build a second temple. This would have been it if they had been fully wholeheartedly ashamed of their sins and, and ready to go after God and glorify him as they were supposed to. Uh, they would have had this beautiful temple that Ezekiel describes. But he says that's only if they are ashamed. That's only if they have uh, you know, the right response. The only other place in the Old Testament that could speak of a temple uh, that some people think is a third temple is Zechariah 14. Now, Zechariah 14, again, does not mention that any particular temple is a third one. That sorry, It does talk about a temple in chapter 14, but uh, I don't believe it's talking about a third temple. I don't have time to go into that in detail because we're at a break now, but uh, yeah, there's really nothing. There's really nothing in the Old or New Testament that says that there's going to be a third temple, although uh, some people interpret passages that are talking about the second temple as if it's a third one. I'm not sure why they do. They almost forget that there was a second one already. Listen, the Narrow Path uh, is a listener-supported ministry. Uh, we are only halfway through the program. We have another half hour coming up. But if you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can write to the Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. I'll be right back in 30 seconds. Don't go away. If you call the narrow path, please have your question ready as soon as you are on the air. Do not take much time setting up the question or giving background. If such detail is needed to clarify your question, the host will ask for such information. Our desire is to get as many callers on the air during the short program. There are many calls waiting behind you, so please be considerate to others. Welcome back to The Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, you're always welcome to call them here. If you disagree with the host, and certainly a very large percentage of our listeners probably do on some point or other, feel free to give me a call. I'd love to clarify or discuss it. You can balance comment and, uh, and make an alternative position if you want to. The number is 844 Four eight four, fifty seven, thirty seven. All right. Our next caller is going to be Tim from British Columbia. Tim, welcome to, to the Narrow Path. Hey, Steve. Hi. My question is regarding um, Ruth and how she gets redeemed by Boaz. Uh huh. And uh, just kind of how does that work with like Deuteronomy twenty three? Um, the Moabites were not allowed to join the assembly of God, even to the tenth generation. And then you right. have the book of Ruth, which is, takes place after. And then if you go to Nehemiah, for example, um, again, when they read the law, they realize that they've, they've mixed, mixed marriages and they, they, uh, they basically se re-separate. So how do you kind of um, reconcile that? Sure. Well, I believe that when uh, God, t through Moses, told the Israelites that a, a Moabite cannot enter the uh, sanctuary unto the tenth generation, I, I'm thinking it means the 10th generation from Moses' time. That is, from the time he's speaking, you've got to go 10 generations forward before any Moabites will have, uh, you know, their bloodline will have been purged from the things they did in the times of Moses. Uh, and Ruth might very well have been uh, 10 generations, depending on how we mark a generation. It was, she was certainly hundreds of years after Moses' time. Uh, very possibly as much as three or four hundred years. And if a generation was seen to be 30 or 40 years, she might well have been 10 generations removed. And, of course, David himself was descended from her. and uh, yeah. But he was he was three generations further away than that. She was his great-grandmother. So, um, you know, it, it seems to me that if to the 10th generation means starting at Moses' time, from now on, 10 generations forward, no Moabites can come in. Now, the other uh, uh, seeming possible meaning of that phrase could mean nobody who has any Moabites in their ancestry going back 10 generations in their ancestry can, uh, can be, uh, you know, can come in. Well, then, of course, Ruth uh, and David and so forth would not be qualified. 
Now, I will say this. Uh, David did, uh, you know, kind of break the mold on the law on some things. He ate showbread, and that didn't, that didn't uh, condemn him. Uh, and, you know, he, he wore an ephod, which only the priests were supposed to do, and that didn't condemn him. David did break ceremonial laws from time to time, and Jesus implied in Matthew 12 that, that David was blameless before God for this, even though David was not blameless for breaking moral laws like adultery and murder. He was held responsible for that until he repented. But, but the other, breaking the ceremonial laws, he didn't even seem to be have to repent of. And I'm not sure why, other than God just kind of gave him some special, um, you know, dispensation, as it were, as a, maybe as a type of Christ, or maybe because uh, he knew that the ceremonial law didn't matter to God anywhere near as much as a broken and contrite spirit does. That's why David said, if, if you wanted sacrifices and offerings, I'd offer them. That's the ceremonial law. But he says, the, the sacrifice of God is a broken and contrite spirit. And I've got that. And, you know, it may be that I, David definitely, not only is a type of Christ, but seems to have been uh, aware of God's priorities, such as are revealed mostly in the New Testament. But he did, he seemed to grasp this uh, a thousand years before the time of Christ. On the other hand, David is one who meditated day and night on the scripture and received revelations and prophecies. He's called a prophet in Acts chapter 2. And uh, so, you know, he, he knew stuff that, uh, about God's priorities and God's mind in his heart that apparently was a person who's more of a legalist in the Old Testament wouldn't have grasped. Uh, God does make some exceptions for people. Uh, in the Old Testament, um, and David being especially one that he seems to have done so for. So that might explain that. Now, the other part was, you know, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people had married uh, outside the, uh, the racial boundaries of what God allowed them to marry. Um, now, God really had never, in the law, forbidden Jews to marry Moabites and Ammonites. He did uh, he did forbid them to marry Canaanites, and uh, apparently that's what was going on. But it wasn't simply that, because a Jew married a Canaanite named Rahab and was also in Jesus' ancestry, just like Ruth was. Uh, now, Rahab was a Canaanite, but she converted. She was a woman of faith in God. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. What God was against was not interracial marriage, but interfaith marriage. The problem with the Canaanites is they were gross pagans, and God didn't want Israel intermarrying with them, not because they were of a different bloodline, but because they were of a different spiritual character and different religion. They were idolatrous pagans. So when uh, a Canaanite, like Rahab, converted to Judaism, she was a Jew. She's, as it says in, in Scripture, in, I think it's Exodus 12, like a native of the land herself. Ruth also converted, and so she was like a native of the land, too. So it would seem like some of these um, restrictions on <clears throat> marriage to different races had more to do with the, the religions of those races than their racial ancestry. And if they changed religions, it's almost like they didn't have that racial ancestry anymore. Now, in Ezra and Nehemiah's time, the people were marrying pagans, and they were adopting the pagan religions. That was Solomon's problem. Solomon married pagans women, and he, he built shrines for their gods. This is the problem that God warned against. And, you know, so this is something that God was not tolerant of. The Jewish people who were supposed to be his people, worshipping the people of Baal, or the people of Ra, or the people of Moloch, or the people of some other god. That's That was where the objection lay. So, that, those would be my thoughts on your questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the uh, yeah, food for thought. Okay, Tim. Appreciate your call. God bless. Uh, Eddie in Kentucky, welcome to the Narrow Path. Howdy, Steve. Howdy. I've got a question for you. I, was late, I think it was Tuesday of last week. You was talking to a caller about uh, the Garden of Eden. Uh-huh. Did I misunderstand you to say that there was no longer a Garden of Eden? And if I did, uh, don't it say somewhere in the Bible that once that God put them out of the garden, he put an angel with a flaming sword to guard the tree of life. 
That's right. If you chose to elaborate on that, I'll get off and listen to you on the radio. Thank sure. you, young man. Oh, thank you for your call. I'm not a young man. I'm yeah. old. <laughs> but, but thank you, Eddie. We'll talk about that. Well, yeah, there is no Garden of Eden today. But that doesn't mean that the Garden of Eden ceased to exist instantly after Adam and Eve sinned. They were driven out of the Garden of Eden, which means they weren't there to tend it anymore. It's going to go wild. You, you, you don't have any people in a garden, and it becomes a jungle. Uh, but in the meantime, there was the Tree of Life there. And there was always the, I guess, concern on God's part that while that Tree of Life was there, they might go and eat of it and live uh, and live forever, which he didn't want them to do at that point because of their fallen state. And so he guarded the way to the tree of life as long as it was there. Now, we don't know how long it was there, but we know that some things that have happened since that time would preclude the possibility of it being there now. One of those things is the flood. I don't think there's any vegetation or trees or plants uh, that are still uh, growing today that were around before the flood which was, you know, what, 4,500 years ago or something like that. And so uh, that garden wouldn't be there now. Everything would have been uprooted and covered over with mudslides and things like that. Now, the, you know, the, the geographical coordinates would still be there. I mean, if, you, if we knew what the geographical coordinates were bef before, we could go to the same spot, but we don't know where it was exactly. And even if we did, we wouldn't find the garden there. We'd find probably a desert it's in the you know, it's in the uh, tigris euphrates valley area and so i mean uh that that's why i would say there's no garden of eden there anymore but that doesn't mean that it disappeared as soon as they sinned and so i think that's what you're concerned about why would god put an angel and a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life if it's not there anymore well it was there it was there for some time we don't know how long but it didn't just vanish from the face of the earth when adam and Eve left it I believe, no doubt, what happened is it got overgrown and became just jungle until the time of the flood, and now who knows what it is. So that those are that that would be how I would understand your question. I appreciate your call, uh, Jonathan from Linden, Washington. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh -huh. I'm uh, looking at Hebrews four fourteen through sixteen, where it talks about. Um, Jesus passing through the heavens, and uh, it says, you know, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, but, uh, and I'm thinking about it in context of that first four chapters where the movement has been uh, from this eternal son in chapter one, become the incarnate Jesus in chapter two, and uh, I think I've always read 414 as talking about the ascent of the high priest, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if if it's probably better to read 414 as talking about passing through the heavens as a descent uh, into creation uh, movement. Well, let's see. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So you're saying he passed through the heavens in descending to earth rather than this being yeah. a reference to him ascending into heaven. Uh, well, yeah, I don't, comes later. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would reach that conclusion. I, I suppose one could uh, take it that way if they wanted to, in view of the fact that Paul said in Ephesians about Jesus, it says in Ephesians 4, 8, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Then he says, now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended? to the lower parts of the earth. That is, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he had to come down from heaven, or else there would be no way to ascend there. He was in heaven before he came here, but he first descended to the lower regions of the earth, lived his life here, and then ascended. So he's saying the very fact that we speak of him ascending, when in fact he originally was in heaven in the first place, means he must have first come down so that he could ascend again. And so passing through the heavens upward and downward are both referred to. In fact, Paul suggests that one motion uh, presupposes the other. If he ascended, it means he first descended. So when you say that he passed through the heavens, could mean his descent rather than his ascent. Uh, I, I guess I couldn't rule that out. I don't think that is likely to be the meaning for the simple reason that the writer of Hebrews is speaking about his priestliness. 
And in chapter 9, he talks about how Jesus, as a high priest, ascended or went into the holiest of all with his own blood, just like the high priest does on, the, on Yom Kippur. He takes the blood of an animal into the Holy of Holies and sprinkles the mercy seat. This is the uh, way that... Um, this is the way that the writer of Hebrews is seeing what Jesus did when he went to heaven into the Holy of Holies. And he says in verse 11 of chapter 9, But Christ came as high priest of good things to come, not uh, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained redemption, eternal redemption. Now, that, that means, of course, after he died and rose again, when he obtained eternal redemption, he went into the most holy place, which is identified here with heaven, as a high priest to offer blood there, as the priest did when he went into the Holy of Holies. So, in speaking of Christ's priesthood, I think the writer of Hebrews is thinking primarily of what we call his present session. That's what theologians call it. His session is his time between his ascension and his return. The time we're living in now, he's, his session in heaven. What's he doing? Well, he's acting as a high priest, just like the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. That's what Jesus has done. He's gone up into the Holy of Holies in heaven. And therefore, in chapter 4, where he speaks about Jesus being a high priest who passed through the heavens, it strikes me as probable that he means when he ascended into heaven and went into the Holy of Holies, that's his high priestly role. But you're, you're right in the sense that for him to do that, he had to first come down through the heavens to be among us here. I just don't know that that's what the writer of Hebrews would be have primarily in mind by using that phrase. Okay, yeah, I, I understand the chapter 9 part. I was just thinking more specifically about the kind of the logic of the argument as it progressed through the book. Well, saying, you know, it's true, the first... No. Yeah, the first chapters, you're right, the first chapters are showing that Jesus is superior to everything, to the angels, to Moses, to Joshua, to Aaron, the high priest. Uh, you know, he's, he's superior to everything great in the Old Testament. That's what the, the opening movement of the book of Hebrews is about. But I'm not sure that you're correct in saying that, it's, that the chapters move through the, the phases of Jesus' life. Um, or whatever. I think it's just, uh, it's got a variety of quotations from the Old Testament, which simply demonstrate Jesus' status is greater than that of anything in the Old Testament that was also great. So I, yeah, I think the progress of the logic that you're seeing there may, well, I guess I'm not seeing that as the progress intended by the author, but, you know, I wouldn't have any objection to somebody seeing it that way, so that's, that's okay with me. I just would uh, register uh, a different opinion about that probably all right let's talk next to robert from arizona hi robert welcome hi steve hey steve hi. i have a question about uh in revelation it talks about mystery babylon the mother mm -hmm. of harlots mm -hmm. is that a church and if the if she's a mother of harlots would she have daughter churches well you know who is mystery babylon you know, the harlot in Revelation 17 and 18 and 19. Um, that is a big question. There are, there are dozens of uh, ideas about it, and, and probably the idea that someone would adopt would be based on what view of Revelation as a whole they are taking. For example, if you take a futurist view of Revelation, and this is all about the future, then there would be some kind of anti-God um, movement, uh, possibly apostate church, because she's the harlot, which suggests, I mean, in the in the Old Testament, when Israel broke their vows to God, their covenant, uh, she is described as a harlot. The church could be seen the same way if we have a covenant with God and we've been violating it, committing spiritual adultery. And so many people do see the harlot as a church. Some of them see it as the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, some of them see it as some maybe World Council of Churches type liberal a movement where where churches join together into one you know big movement uh, based on the lowest common denominator of agreement which means they have to compromise on all the important points of jesus uh, movement so th this futurist idea does look for something like that maybe a, a an apostate church um i don't take a futurist view generally speaking to revelation maybe some parts but i'm 
if a person takes a preterist view, which uh, strikes me as having a great deal of evidence in the book in its favor, then uh, among those who take that, some have seen Mystery Babylon as a reference to Rome. And the fall of Babylon is the fall of Rome. Others see it as Jerusalem itself. Not a future Jerusalem, but Jerusalem in the days of the apostles. Uh, the harlot is drunk with the blood of the martyrs. Now, Rome killed a lot of Christian martyrs, so that, that could make her be uh, identified with Rome. However, Jesus said that the judgment for all the blood of all the martyrs would come on Jerusalem in that generation, he said in Matthew 23. And therefore, many think that this is a reference to Jerusalem, uh, characterized as Babylon. Now, this would not be too strange because earlier in Revelation, in chapter 11 and verse 8, the city where our Lord is crucified, it's called, which is, of course, Jerusalem, is said to be spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, the city of Jerusalem. Now, if it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, there'd be certainly no reason it couldn't be spiritually called Babylon, too. Sodom, Egypt, Babylon, these pagan uh, uh, nations that came under God's severe judgment. Uh, you know, if Jerusalem is like a spiritual Sodom and Egypt, it could certainly be a spiritual uh, Babylon as well. And interestingly, the judgments that are coming in the book of Revelation often resemble the judgment that came on Sodom. There's a lot of fire and brimstone in the book of Revelation, which comes from the story of the destruction of Sodom. There's a lot of plagues, like the plagues of Egypt, which reminds us of Exodus and the judgment on Egypt. And there's also the kings of the east coming and drying up the river Euphrates to get under the wall of Babylon, which is what Cyrus did, and that's how Babylon fell in the Old Testament. That's also in the book of Revelation. And so there is a, there is a good strong case to make for it being Jerusalem. Though many people feel like it's Rome, and then, of course, there's others who believe it's some apostate church in the end times. You'd have to really evaluate uh, the, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of each of the different views of Revelation as a whole before you could really make an intelligent decision about who Babylon or any other major uh, figure in Revelation is supposed to represent. It sounds like there's something, um, it sounds like a delay or something there. All right, let's talk to um, David from New Mexico. David, welcome to The Narrow Path. Hey, Steve. I have a couple of related questions. Um, number one, I was wondering, uh, why is it that uh, in the Bible or uh, that there's no date or, or dates uh, for important events in the life of Christ? I was just wondering if there's a reason the way they wrote or if that was a common thing. Maybe not to list dates, like for instance, of the the birth of Christ or even the the resurrection of Christ. But the other more important question I was going to ask you was related to the burial of Christ in relation to the controversy about is it the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Garden Tomb? I was wondering, is there a best argument to be made for either one of those? And because some skeptics will say, well, you know, why why don't we know exactly where he was laid? Well, you know, it's a good point, because we also don't know where Moses was laid, and it specifically says in Deuteronomy that the Lord took his body and buried it somewhere where no one would know, um, apparently, to prevent his, you know, burial place from becoming some kind of a shrine or something, because Moses was so important. It may be, uh, I mean, certainly there's nothing wrong with worshiping Jesus. He's God, and therefore we should worship him. But it may be that God doesn't want us worshiping him in terms of holy places and holy days and things like that. Uh, remember okay. when Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians, I think it's 410, he he chastised them saying, you, you observe days and seasons and months and years. He said, I think I've labored for you in vain. Uh, the idea being that the, the ritual aspects of worship that both the Jewish religion and most other religions include, including many Christian religions, include lots of rituals, that those are not the way that God cares to be worshipped. Jesus said that God was looking people for people to worship him in spirit and in truth, which is in contrast to in ritual and, and hypocrisy. Not that all ritual worship is hypocritical, but I think that spirit, worshipping in spirit means not in ritual, but in, in, it's an interior 
heartfelt worship, not something you do with outward rituals. And in truth, I think, means genuinely or, or sincerely. Uh, so, you know, the idea of a lot of religious rituals, holy days, holy places, and stuff like that, it would appear that the coming of Christ and the Holy Spirit has changed all that. Remember, Jesus told the woman of the well, the hour is coming when they won't worship in Jerusalem or in this mount. They're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And it's, it's not be holy places. You know, Jerusalem is a holy place to the Jews, and and uh, Mount Gerizim was a holy place to the Samaritans. But Jesus said, yeah, but the time's coming when neither of those are going to be important places. Um, because there are no important places. Remember, Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, the most holy does not dwell in houses made with hands, which means no physical temples, no physical buildings, no physical locations are holy places at all. They were in the Old Testament, but this is the New Testament time now. And we don't, you know, God is looking for people who worship him in spirit and truth, not through religious rituals. Now, if we had the actual birth date of Jesus or the actual death date of Jesus, where well, we kind of do, we know what, what time of year it was, not the birth date, but the death date. Uh, you know, we might we might obsess on it. I mean, look how people obsess on Christmas. I like Christmas, frankly. I like Christmas, but and we even know it's not the real birthday of Jesus. But what's interesting is we're not told what the real birthday of Jesus is. How? how what an omission. Like you say, why doesn't the Bible give us more dates and places and, and those kinds of things? Because of our propensity to assign holiness to dates and places. And uh, that's what Frankly, that's what pagan religions do. In Christ, every place is a holy place. All ground is holy ground. You can't go somewhere and live a secular life some of the week and then go to another place and have to be holy another part of the week because the whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness is, uh, of, of, of it. Now, uh, we do know something about the timing of Christ's ministry, but not very much. We know the year, for example, that Jesus began his ministry, because we're told in Luke 3, 1, it's the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, uh, which is seven, 27 AD. It says Pontius Pilate was the governor. Well, he was governor from 26 to 36 AD. He says Herod was the Tetrarch of Galilee. Well, he was in that position between 4 BC and uh, 39. And this is when Jesus was 30 years old. So you can go back a little bit and say, well, he was born you know, right around uh, 4 or 5 B.C. And uh, he started his ministry in 27 A.D. As far as the length of his ministry, we're not really told how long it was, except there are three and possibly four Passovers mentioned in his ministry. Now, between one Passover and another, there's a whole year. So if there's two Passovers, that, that measures a year. If there's three, that's two years. If there's four, that's three years. And Jesus started his ministry a little bit before a Passover, which be, you know, add a few more months to whatever the date is. Now, was it two and a half or three and a half years we're looking at? Well, that depends on how we understand the feast mentioned in uh, John chapter 5. We don't know if it was a Passover or not. If it was a Passover, then there were four Passovers in the ministry of Jesus. And, and plus some months, so it would be about three and a half years. So we have some idea of the general time frame. He would have died around 30 or 31 A.D., probably. Uh, maybe 32. Depends. But uh, I think the reason we aren't given more specifics is because religiosity in us tends to obsess on just those kinds of specifics. Holy days, holy places, and so forth. Now, as far as the place of Jesus' birth... I couldn't decide between the tomb of the, home, you know, the Holy Sepulchre or the, uh, or I mean, I, I mean the place of his burial. I think the garden tomb fits it well, but I, I, I don't know. And I, again, that's something God didn't let us know. I'm sorry we're out of time. You're listening to the uh, Narrow Path. Our website's thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Sponsored by The Narrow Path. You can join Steve Gregg every week afternoon at 2 o'clock here on True Talk 800. Coming up next, we have Living God Ministries with Aaron Budgen. Then at 3.30, it's In Touch with Charles Stanley. We have an opportunity for you to win a homeschool resource bundle right now. If you or someone you know is homeschooling, we have some great resources to help succeed with homeschooling. Enter to win one of five homeschool resource bundles 